are out uh, this morning. This is probably the largest crowd we've had in a while. School's back in session, the kids are back in school, and I think everybody is uh, finding their way back home. And we, we thank you for coming today. <clears throat> Last month, we have such good young people here, such fine young men and women, young men and women. Uh, you know, last month, Zach gave a lesson, very well done. Today, Micah gave a lesson, Micah 16. I gave my first lesson when I was 24. And I had worked for almost a month with a local preacher there. And it was supposed to be a 30 minute lesson. I finished in seven minutes. <laughs> No clue what I was doing. I thought I did, but I didn't. Micah had it very well organized. He had three main points. He spoke clearly, and we appreciate so much all of our young people. In about two weeks, we're going to start a new class back in the <clears throat> big classroom on the book of Hebrews. Some of you will come in there, and that's fine, and if you can't make it, that's okay, too, because Sean will be doing uh, Exodus here in, in the auditorium. But we're going to record every one of the lessons back there. Uh, all of the, the paperwork and all the, the uh, material is downloaded to our website. So whether you're there in person or whether you see it uh, online, uh, it, it's free there for the, for the uh, taking. And we, we hope that you will do that. Uh, Greg and I are going to be teaching that class. And uh, we're actually looking forward to it. We've done a lot of preparation for this. Uh, the material is excellent. The, the teachers may be not so much. <laughs> no, it'll, 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 be, it'll be just fine. I want to get a little jump start <clears throat> today, if you will, on the book of Hebrews. Uh, Greg and I came up with the idea, well, actually, the idea is in, in the book itself, but Jesus is better. Jesus is better. We, we see that this, this letter was written by its very name to Hebrews, to Jewish Christians, who after a while, they've been Christians for a while, we'll see that on the next slide or two, they were having second thoughts. They were having second thoughts about this Christianity thing. They started asking themselves, is this really worth it? Because things aren't going so well for us right now. And we'll look at some of the things they were, they were going through with persecutions and being ostracized by their own people and all those kinds of things. So the, the letter was written to these Hebrew Christians, some say it was in, in the city of Rome. Uh, some I kind of lean toward that, but some say it was the city of Jerusalem. It doesn't, it doesn't say. It doesn't say. But we know that it was written to Jewish Christians who were struggling. Now, you have to ask yourself, uh, and you'll see this as we go, particularly the last two slides, we all struggle. Yeah, I suspect at times, I suspect if I say, raise your hand in here if you've never had a struggle, there will not be a hand raised. So th this is not new ground. Uh, it shouldn't have not have been new ground for even the, the Hebrew Christians and certainly not for us as well. Just to kind of take just a little um, um, affirmation here, reaffirmation on who it was written to, there's a lot of quotations in the book of Hebrews from the Old Testament. Now, who better would understand the Old Testament quotations, the Psalms, and all of those things uh, than, than Jews? They knew the Old Testament. They had been God's chosen people for 1,500 years, something like that, 1,500 years. And they were struggling letting go of that. We see Jesus in the psalm, particularly in Psalms chapter 2. We, we, we see that. They knew that. They, they had read Psalms 2 in their lives. Uh, they knew about the Levitical priesthood from the tribe of Levi. They were still, because this is probably somewhere around 62 
to maybe 64 AD, and we all know what happened in 70 AD. Jerusalem and Judaism was destroyed. All the records were destroyed. So based on some of the things that are said here, it's not 70 AD yet, that we're pretty sure of. But so they were able to trace their lineage back with all the records that were in the temple that's gonna be destroyed in about six years. Totally destroyed. The Levitical priesthood from the tribe of Levi, they were the only ones that could serve in the temple. And then there's a tabernacle. We're gonna see that when Jesus comes in, that's no longer the case. And they don't like it. They knew about Abraham, our, well, our father Abraham. You know, they were, they were prone to say that quite a bit. And Melchizedek, they knew about that. They knew all about that. Uh, when you get over into chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7. When you go to Hebrews 9, you can see about the tabernacle, the holy place, the most holy place, and all of that. Uh, animal sacrifices were still being conducted. Well, they're learning and they're reemphasizing the book of Hebrews. There's one sacrifice, Jesus, and he did it one time for all time. There were not daily sacrifices, weekly sacrifices, monthly sacrifice. There weren't. There was one. They're struggling with that. They're struggling with that. Moses and the patriarchs. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all down through, that, that, that's our father. Those are our fathers. Uh, this Jesus, uh, we're beginning to have second thoughts about. So without a doubt, this is written to Hebrews. Hebrews who were struggling with Jesus. And the book is going to show beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. They had also been Christians for a good while. Well, how do we know that? Well, <clears throat> we won't turn to all, all of these, but I gave you just kind of a cliff notes here of, of these. In chapter 10, uh, the writer says, recall your former days. They had gone through persecutions before and they're getting ready to go through them again. In your former days, in your former days, He says in, in chapter 5, and verse 12, and this, this can apply to us. It does apply to us today. He says, look, by this time, you ought to be teachers. And you have need that someone teach you yet. That implies that they've been Christians for a while and, and that uh, God expected more out of them. You know, if we're where we are now, uh, in our spirituality where we were five years ago. Shame on you. That's not good. And the Hebrew writer uh, indicates that. And then they were concerned. Have you, have you ever been concerned about this? You know, we took food to so-and-so last year. We picked people up to, to bring them to church. We do, we do, I help people that are in need. We do this, we do that. And we go, I hope God remembers that. They did too. And the writer says, he's not unjust to forget your works. We may forget it. I think that's sometimes why we, we tell everybody what, when we do good works. I hope God doesn't forget this. God's not going to forget. He said in chapter 13 that there are some of you who um, are prisoners. And he said, don't, don't forget those that are prisoners with you. you, you you're chained to them just, just as if you were with them. Um, so many times Paul in his letters said, you know, please pray for us and remember us in our chains. Remember us in our chains. And then the one that kind of a dagger to the heart. The writer, I almost said Paul. If I do that, maybe it was Paul, maybe it wasn't, doesn't say. He said, you've not resisted the bloodshed yet. 
You have it so bad, you think. Have you suffered yet uh, through blood? Have you shed your blood yet for Jesus? They were saying, woe is us. And said, you've not resisted the bloodshed yet, have you? And the answer was, now they may, and they probably did later. We may someday, but we haven't yet. So these Christians had been Christians for a while. They were not new. They were not new. They should have known better. And now they're on the, on the verge of falling away. Now there are religious people. A lot of denominations say you can't fall away. Well, the Bible doesn't understand that. If we're seeing in, in all of these verses about falling away, what does falling away imply? You had to be somewhere in, in a good state before you fell away. You can't leave home unless you were at home. So in chapter 3 and verse 12, uh, this writer, the Hebrew writer, says, Beware, brethren, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in what? Departing from the living God. You can depart from the living God. The Bible says. Chapter 4 and verse 1, chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, be diligent now. Be diligent, lest, there, uh, lest you fall, lest you fall away. As Micah mentioned in 1 Corinthians 9 this morning, uh, we're in a race. Now, when are you crowned in a race, a long-distance race? You're crowned when you go across the finish line. They're wanting the crown, but they're not wanting to finish it. We get our crown when we cross the finish line. In chapter 5 and verse 11, it talks about once, you, once you're enlightened, once you become a Christian and you fall away, it's very difficult to be restored. What more could Jesus do for you or for, for me once you fall away? And it's a rhetorical question, not much, because you fell away. You walked away. And then we mentioned already about God will not forget your works in chapter 6. Chapter 6. And the implication there is don't become lazy. Don't become lazy. Have you ever become lazy in God's service? Yes, I have. And I suspect you have uh, as well. So they were on the verge of falling away. The book of Hebrews was, was, was written to, to encourage them to hang in there. Do not fall away. Do not fall away. And he gives us examples. Jesus learned obedience in chapter 5 by through his sufferings. We learn obedience, we learn long suffering. We learn patience. Uh, we learn our, more and more about our dependence upon God when we suffer. You do. Chapter 11, it's sometimes called the Hall of Faith, Hall of Fame of Faith, whatever you like to call it. Starts with Abel and goes to all these great men that the Jewish people certainly knew. They knew it well. Abraham, Enoch, Noah, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Raham, Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, and the prophets, uh, and the list goes on. And in chapter 10, he talks about when, when you're suffer, when you are reproached, when you become spectacles, don't draw back. He says in chapter 11, he said, the world is not, was not worthy of such men and women. The world's not worthy of Christians. We're the light of the world, or we should be. And in chapter 12, one of our favorite chapters, you, we see ourselves surrounded by these great cloud of witnesses in chapter 11. Great cloud of witnesses, all these great men and women. And they're watching us, as it were. And they're saying, 
Just like in any arena, you can do this. You can do this. Here's the bottom line problem with the Hebrews, and sometimes the bottom line problem with us. The law of Moses, Judaism, was beginning to conflict quite dramatically with the ministry of Jesus. They were God's special people and they did not take kindly to Gentiles being allowed in to this exclusive club, they, they, they thought. They didn't like it. Acts 15, you remember that there at Jerusalem, that great conference, Peter says, God made no difference. He made no distinction between uh, us and them, meaning the Jews and the Gentiles. A person can be right without being a Jew. They struggle with that. They struggle with it. Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus brought the Jews and the Gentiles together. Now you've got to keep in mind that it's easy for us 2,000 years later to look at those Jews and say, what's your problem? They didn't have the completed New Testament yet. It was in men. It was in the apostles. It was through miraculous gifts and all those things. So before we get too critical of them, we need to be careful because we can do some of the same things. Jesus, uh, this writer says that, that we have a greater high priest. Remember all of that? that the high priest would go in once a year. What did he do before he went in to offer sacrifice for, for the sins of the people? He had to offer sacrifice sin for himself. And he did it once a year. Jesus entered into the most holy place, if you will, one time for all time, and not to offer a sacrifice for his sins. He didn't have any sins but for our sins, and one time for all time, the faith was delivered in Jude, Jude 3. There were a lot of customs and traditions that the Jews had, and they weren't necessarily wrong. They'd been observing them for 1,500 years, and they still wanted to observe them religiously. In a lot of cases. So the Jews' problem was not, um, we don't want to give up our Jewish kosher laws. We don't want to give that up. They didn't give it up. They never did give it up. Uh, we don't want to give up not working on the Sabbath day. They didn't. That was okay. If, you know, the old law said you could not walk on the Sabbath day more than seven-eighths of a mile. They still observe those things. Okay. In Acts 21, remember that, when Paul was called on the carpet at the end of his third missionary journey. And they said, you know, Brother Paul, we're hearing, we're getting a lot of bad feedback about you, that you're saying while you're out on your journeys that you don't have to be circumcised. Is that correct? And other things like that. When it wasn't a religious matter, Paul had people circumcised so as not to be a roadblock, but he didn't have them circumcised if it was, it was one of the requirements of being saved. So there was a difference. They were beginning, the, the, the Hebrews in 62, 64 AD, Nero was getting close to being uh, on the throne, but not quite yet. And remember when Rome burns down, he blames the Christian. It gets rough then. We're not quite there. We're only a year or so away, maybe two years. But Jewish, they were being persecuted more and more by Jewish brethren. They were beginning to endure social rejection. Now let's face it. Does anybody in here like to be socially rejected? We don't. We don't. They were. At this point, they were. 
the load was getting too heavy to carry. They were being loaded down spiritually and they're ready to quit. They're ready to quit. That was their problem. And the writer is trying his best to explain to these Jewish Christians why they need to continue on. They need to continue on. They were beginning to feel marginalized. We know what marginalized means. Margins means you're on the, you're on the, you're on the outside, you're on the edge. You're about to be pushed over the edge. They felt like they were on the margin. In economics, margin means if you change a variable by one, what's the result of, that, of changing that variable? We could even apply that here. One more thing may push them off the side. Society was drawing lines, beginning to draw some serious lines about being a Christian. The, only, the Jewish people were even against Jewish Christians. They couldn't go to family reunions anymore, so to speak. We see that even in, in uh, our society today. It was very important to them to have an identity a Jewish identity. Now this Jesus comes along and says that's not really what we need to do any longer. You mean we might have to, to, to give up our established group? And they began to feel frustrated and angry and even bitter. So we, we can see that they've about had it. They've about had it. Falling away. COVID has been rough on Christians, on all, all people. But you can see even by the numbers posted on attendance in churches all around this country. And we've talked, maybe COVID was God's way of separating the, the weak from the strong. I don't, we don't know those things. But we know that there have been churches that I know of back east who 30, they're down 30%, 35% in their attendance. Falling away is usually not one thing. Attendance. The elders are always, so what's a big deal about attendance? The elders watch that and we watch individuals. It's not necessarily an indication, but a lot of times that's the first step. Attendance goes down. Bible study starts to wane. Bible study goes down. We're not studying like we, like we were. We don't pray like we used to. We don't associate with Christians as much as we used to. These are warning signs. These are warning signs. And when the elders meet with people, and <clears throat> we do that quite often, we have even recently, one of the first questions we ask, how's your prayer life? You can take it to the bank. We're not praying like we were. That's the answer. Well, how are you, are, is your Bible study? Well, we're not studying like we used to. Are you reading on a weekly basis the, our readings in Luke and Acts for this year? Well, sometimes. Be careful. You're on your way out. It's easy to fall away once you start getting into these situations. That's what the, that's what the Jewish Christians were doing in the book of Hebrews. Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, bear one another's burdens. You drop down three verses and he says, each one shall bear his own load. In the military, you carried packs. Whether you were going to tech school, you had these books full of things when you were going to radar school at night, 
or when you're in basic training, you're carrying these loads. And there was always a few in, in every, in our case, every flight that couldn't, couldn't make it very well. What happened to their packs or their loads? We carried it for them. Carried it for them. There are times as Christians where we have to look around to one another and see who are exhibiting signs of falling away. And you go to them with all the love you can muster, with all the care and the concern that you, you, you can bring to the fore, and see how you can help them. Because I'll tell you, there are times when you carry other people's loads, and you know what? There's a time when they will have to carry your load. It, it will happen. If it hasn't already, it will. That's what Christians do. So when your load gets too heavy and you're thinking about quitting, remember what Peter said? Remember when, when the people walked away from Jesus and he just wistfully looked at them and said, are you going away too? And Peter, what, what was Peter's reply? Lord, we got no place to go. Who are we going to go to? Who are we going to go to? A seventh grade teacher said, don't ever end a uh, sentence with a preposition. <laughs> but who are we going to go to? You have the words of life. So when you get discouraged, and we all do at times, hang in there, call somebody, and say, I need you to help you carry my load, because I'm down right now. I need, I need your help. But don't quit, because you got no place to go. Remember what Peter said in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22, 23? That when a, when a Christian falls away, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. Or a pig that's been washed returning to the mud. That's how God views us when we fall away. It's not a pretty sight. It's not a pretty sight. And God didn't mean for it to be a pretty sight. We don't want to lose anybody. God wants all of us to stay. So stay with him. Hang in there. Now, all that's a nice history lesson. We're going to get dig into it much deeper, obviously, than that. But what does that mean to you and me? Preacher said one time, uh, if you have a lesson and, there, and there's no lessons for us, you're just showing off. Has to be lessons. Has to be lessons for us. Number one, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Our faith is, is built on better promises. Our faith is built on a better high priest. Our faith is built on a better mediator. You know, Jesus sits at God's right hand when he went back to heaven and he pleads our case. I get a picture sometimes of when, when, when Jesus is sitting there at God's right hand and Mitch is messed up again, that he just kind of whispers, <clears throat> whispers over to him. He's a good boy. He's, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be all right. This is what he really meant to do. And the Holy Spirit pleads those things for us as well. Jesus is better. We all have problems. Shock. I don't see a shocked face in here. We all have health problems, family problems, church problems, wife problems, or husband problems. <laughs> problems with our children. We all have problems. Wilson Adams has said before, I've heard him say it more than once, we, we, we say, even ourselves, you know, there's problems in every church. Well, there are. He says, there are problems on every row. 
I believe that's true. There are problems on every single row. Now, it's our job to try to help people who are having these problems. Now, we're not mind readers. None of us are mind readers. Sometimes you've got to go to somebody you trust and open up to them. We all have problems. We also know that people, people at work, our neighbors, our friends, yea, even Christians, will, will, can and will disappoint you. That will happen. That hurts. That hurts. Everyone gets discouraged at times. Everyone gets discouraged at times. Persecutions will come. If you've not been persecuted for being a Christian lately, you might want to look in the mirror. They're on, they're on the way. Persecutions. And we have to count the cost, as our reading said this morning. Remember in Luke 14? There, Jesus said, I want you to count the cost, whether this is going to be worth it to you. And the implication is you have that decision to make. Is it going to be worth it to follow Jesus? And there are many, most of the world says, no, it's not. It's not. Because I may have to suffer, and that's correct. That may get into my bank account, that's correct. Count the cost. Because Jesus said, I'd rather for you to count the cost and say, I'm not going to do this, than, than just to play games with it. Luke 14, count the cost. And you don't quit. There's a story <clears throat> about an old farmer who had an old donkey. And that old donkey fell into an old well. And the farmer tried to get this old donkey out of the well. He couldn't do it. He dug and he put ropes around this donkey and he did all kinds of things and he could not get that donkey out. And the donkey was just screaming. Well, I don't know if a donkey screams or not. Uh, brayed. Uh, a, a donkey, he just kept braying. And it hurt the old farmer. Boy, I hate to hear that. I can't get him out. He's going to die. What I'm going to do is get a shovel and fill that well in. Wait, what? I'm going to fill that in with this dirt over the donkey, and I'll solve two problems here. So he called all of his friends and said, bring your shovel to my house. It's going to take a while to fill this, fill this well in. So they started shoveling, and the dirt was going on, on the donkey. And the donkey quit braying. So after a couple of hours of all of his friends shoveling, he said, I'm going to go over and look. So he looked over there, and this donkey's still standing there. <clears throat> As each shovel of dirt would come into the well, he would shake it off. And then he would step up on the dirt. The dirt kept being shoveled in. He kept stepping up on the dirt. And eventually he walked out of the well. What's the moral of this story? Life's going to shovel dirt on you. Don't get bogged down. We can get out of the deepest wells by not stopping. We can get out of the deepest wells by shaking it off, taking a step up. Tough times happen to, to us all. Tough times come, but that tough times don't stay, even though it may seem like that. Tough people do. And God expects us to be tough people. And don't get our feelings hurt over every little thing. And don't threaten to quit every time something don't go our way. 
We'll get that prize at the end of our lives, but it's only at the end of our lives. You know what they call people that go seven-eighths of a marathon? Quitters. You have to finish. We have to finish. Now, some of us are a whole lot closer to, to the sunset than some of the others. But we've all been on that road. And I've told my grandkids before, I know it's going to shock you, but I was 16 one time. Really? Yeah. And it doesn't seem like that long ago. Life is short. James says your life is like a vapor, appears for a little while and vanishes away. The writer told Hebrews, you've got to hang in. You've got to hang in. Jesus is better. Jesus will get us there. Don't quit. And that's our message for us today. We can't quit. God has no patience with quitters. You can't do it. Discouraged, yes. Was Jesus ever discouraged? He surely was. And when people quit, Jesus lost to 8.5% of his apostles. And they lived with him every day for three and a half years. So when we lose people, don't be shocked. No, I'm going to quit. Somebody left. Well, Jesus lost people. So it's going to happen. He lost Judas. You think Judas had the ability to do all those uh, miracles just like the others did? He sure did. You mean Judas could perform miracles and see miracles and do all these things and quit? Yes, he did. But we can't. We can't do it. we got no place to go. Now, if you're a Christian, we always have God and we have Jesus at his right hand pleading our case. If you uh, would like the prayers of the church, you'd like to get back on this right way, uh, I suspect you've already prayed to God. But if you would like, you can come forward <clears throat> and we will pray for you and with you. Not only for you, but for ourselves. Because we need it too. If you're not a Christian... Count the cost. Count the cost. Because it does cost to be a Christian, but it's a, it's a cost well worth it. Have you ever seen anybody on their deathbed, ever, say, you know, I lived all these years. I'm sorry I was a Christian. You'll never see that. I have seen people on their deathbeds that were not Christians, who were screaming and clawing and worrying and with a guilt, guilty conscience like you've never seen before. Ask them, was, it, was their life worth it? And as Micah said even, even this morning, if you're not a Christian, enjoy this life, because this is all there is. This is as good as it's ever going to be for you. If you're a Christian, this will be as bad as it ever get for you, and life's pretty good, because we have that hope on the other side that non-Christians do not. So as Greg leads us in our, in our invitation song, if we can help you in any way, won't you come forward as we stand and sing?